of a, a kind of a different a different way to look at certain things. You'll see a lot of concepts that are repeated, and there's there's a reason for that. Like if we're repeating the same sort of concepts on how to interact with people, how to interact anatomically or with a uh, with like anatomy during the OR and things like that. What I want to do is to kind of give you step by step, you know, how to kind of conduct yourself in the operating room, the things to prepare for when you're going to be there. Our our sub eye rotation is very heavy on operative uh, uh, being in the OR. So the stuff that Mike said is great and we love helping out, but we really want you to kind of see what you're going to be getting into for the majority of the program, not just the intern year. Though the intern year is important, we want you to see kind of uh, what the operating room is like. So it's a very important part of our rotation. I know a lot of my sub eyes was a very important part of that rotation as well. So, um, so just a couple of things. So, but you know, it's not always going to fit into a nice neat box, right? You, it would be ideal if, you know, every night you knew exactly what case you were going to do. You had a couple hours to read up on it. You could go watch all of Dr. Roten's videos about it, read the book and then come in and, and, and be able to stay for the full case. But it doesn't always like fit like that. There'll be emergencies. There'll be things that you get pulled to, pulled away from. So you got to kind of think conceptually and like what, what are the things that you should be doing to succeed in the operating room? And so part of that is thinking about like, what are your goals for a sub internship? What, what are you trying to get out of a sub internship? You have to think a little selfishly, right? Like this is what, what is, what are you trying to get out of this rotation? You know, one of the first things is, is just that at, at a very base level, you're trying to be remembered. You're trying to have the people that make decisions for you writing your letters of recommendation for making the rank list, just remember who you are, but remember you for the right things, right? So you don't want to be the person, you know, I, I, I don't mean to call out our intern here, but Keenan, when he was on his rotation, performed like emergent CPR on a patient that was that was having some trouble. Keenan then gets remembered as a CPR resident. That's a, an example of being or a CPR uh, med student. That's something that's good to be remembered for. You don't want to be remembered as being the guy that was snoring during grand rounds, right? Those are those are so just just make sure that you're doing the right things. Some few a few kind of um, practical things. Introduce yourself to people in the operating room. Do it at the right times. Don't do it when they're trying to put the clip on. Say, hey, my name's Adam. You know, that's the bad time to introduce yourself. Introduce yourself at the beginning of the case. You know, ask appropriate questions like what Mike said. Uh, uh, that's part of the advancing your neurosurgery knowledge. At the end of the day, this is for you. You're here to learn to kind of prepare yourself for being an intern. So you are here to learn neurosurgery when you're doing that rotation. So ask the right questions. But I, I do want to echo what Mike said. There is such thing as a bad question. If you're going into glioblastoma, sir, if you're on your third sub I and you're asking what glioblastoma is, there's the only the only explanation for that is either you're just trying to talk and fill dead space or you never read about what a glioblastoma is in four months of neurosurgery. So you need to uh, uh, be able to ask things. I always I always say don't ask things that are that are try not to ask things that are Googleable, right? Like so so try not to ask don't ask what's a terional craniotomy. You can go home and read about that. There's amazing resources. You can ask, hey, how do you like to do terionals? How do you like to deal with the temporalis during terionals? It shows a next level of insight into the question. Uh, uh, allows for more of a discussion that's, uh, instead of trying to solicit information that you could find on your own free time. So, but at the end of the day, you do want to advance your neurosurgery knowledge. And then one of the things is also demonstrating your ability to, to succeed in residency. Just see Mike's PowerPoint on that. You know, if you're able to kind of demonstrate that you're able to do intern things and that you're going to come in intern PGY2 ready, that's one of the best things that you can do. Uh, the, the, the last thing that I'll say is you, you want to meet the right people. Um, and that's not exactly what what it, it says on face value. So I'm not just talking about the program directors, right? So everyone wants to go to the program directors clinic, the chairs clinic, and they want to go and talk to them. Don't forget about the scrub techs. Don't forget about the nurses. Don't forget about the MPs. Don't forget about the interns. Many times the scrub techs been working with that program director for 20 years. They might be go, they might go to Phillies games together. So you don't want to be the person that like only speaks to the program director, turns your back to the scrub tech, and doesn't act like they exist. So. You want to just and, and it might seem obvious to say this, but it happens every year. Avoid conflict too. If you can't go a month on a rotation without having some conflict with some with someone in the in the operating room or something like that, then that that could be indicative of a problem. So you know, if someone's even if someone's rude to you, like a nurse or a circulator or a scrub tech, if they're like, "Hey, you're breaking the sterile field," like they might not always say in the most gentle way. Okay, yeah, sorry, that's fine, right? So. Um, so making the right impression with the right people. And that's that's everyone that you're going to meet. All right. So the case starts before the operating room. Right. So 
one, whenever you're going in, and now this could be that couple hours the night before reviewing the whole case, or it could be rushing into an emergency cranny, just know what you're doing, right? Like Mike said, you don't want to be operating on the spine and asking if that's the brain. So uh, know who you're operating on. Is this a 70 year old female? Is this like a young kid? Is this who, what, who are you operating on? What are we doing? Where are we operating on? And why are we operating on them? Right? Those are just the most basic questions that, that you can know. All right. Um, Ari already gave you some of the resources. It's really easy to pull up Neurosurgical Atlas on your phone. Read real quick. Just get a couple high points that you know at least the basics of what's going on here. Not only is that great for when people are kind of asking you questions and making impressions, but it's also really good for uh, your learning. Like you're coming in with some pre-knowledge and then you're seeing that and you can recognize, make that connection between what is a diagram, what does it look like on the diagram, and then what am I seeing on the operating microscope? So it, it helps you in multiple ways. Highly, highly recommend. Even if you just have a couple seconds, pop outside the room, pull something up on your phone, go real quick, Google some pictures, something like that. The other thing that I recommend is trying to get in the room before the patient does. Once the patient gets in the room, people are, are running around, residents are trying to pull things up, the anesthesia is trying to pull it, put in lines, all of these things. It kind of can make it onerous to go introduce yourself to the scrub tech, go pull your gloves, all that kind of thing. If you go in there before, you say, hey, my name's Adam, I'm here, I'm one of the med students, I'm here to help, would you like me to pull your gloves? Is there anything else that I can do? It's a great way to introduce yourself to the scrub techs and the circulators that can be some of the most valuable people during the operating room, right? They can help you out, hey, stand here, don't stand here. Dr. Farrell likes this, so you should be on this side, right? All these little nuances that can make you look like you're more experienced than you are and help you stay kind of out of the way and make a good impression. Uh, the third thing is just a nice little touch that I like if you're able to bring up kind of images on the computer, show that you know what's like important and things like that. It can, even if it's the wrong thing, just trying to show that you know that you can help. That's that's always something that, uh, uh, another way to kind of make an impression. Be like, yeah, this person was pulling up the MRI and, and knew what we were doing. So then let's start with the positioning. So just in general, some terminology. You have people being supine, top right, prone, bottom right, lateral, and then everything in between, right? So you can be supine, just a head, head a little bit turned, head a lot of it turned, a little bit of a bump, a lot of bit of a bump, all the way down to being in a park bench in the top left. Um, just kind of know the terminology, know, know kind of what goes into that. Uh, so that when someone, when someone says that we're going prone, you know that at some point there's gonna be a flip happening, right? Now, how can, how can you be helpful during this, right? This is important. So uh, always try to find a way, you know, when you go into the first uh, OR of your sub eye, look to see what's going on. Like, what, are, what is anesthesia doing? What is the residents doing? Are they, we here, we wrap the arms and the pressure points and, and gel wraps. Um, uh, we're always checking kind of the pads. So help do that, right? If you see that the arm's ready to go and no one's wrapped, pick up a gel wrap, put it on the arm. Even if you do it wrong, it's, you're trying to help, right? You're being active. Help with the flip. Always act like you're there. Don't don't be be present. Uh, uh, always helping. Um, keeping an eye on the lines too when you're flipping and stuff like that. It's everyone's responsibility, and so it kind of helps. If you can help, if you help me not to have an arterial line pulled out when I'm flipping for a PCDF, I will forever be indebted to you. I promise you. Um, and then also checking the pressure points. This is one of those things. No one's ever going to fault you if you think that the that the ulnar nerve or the peroneal nerve is being pushed on a little bit because there's nothing worse than having a successful surgery someone waking up with something related to positioning. So making sure that the chest rolls are not shoved up into someone's neck and that there's enough room, at least three finger breaths there. Um, uh, making sure that the elbows are padded, the, the knees and everything's padded. Uh, and it's okay to call it out and be like, hey, do you think this is okay? Totally okay for that. And then always making sure that you're staying on the right side. Wrong side of surgery is a disaster. It's a never event. So if you ever feel like you're noticing it, no one's, again, no one's ever gonna fault you for trying to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the patient. Right. Pinning. I didn't pin much during my sub eye. I think it's one of those things that it's uh, it's not very exciting and can have consequences if you don't do it correctly. But if for some reason you are pinning, there's a couple concepts that are important to note. Uh, just in general, the Mayfield holder has a single pin on one side, two pins on the other side. In general, the way that you think about it is you try to cut the head into an equator uh, perpendicular to where gravity is pulling them down. So this diagram, just for example, right now where the patient is prone with their nose facing down, you draw a little equator. You want to have one of the pins and the two pins be below that equator and then the single pin be just below that equator, right? Um, so that they're they're falling into the pins. If this pin's too high and these pins are too high, that's how thing that's how they say sky. If you get pin slips and things like that, which are never good. All right. So for a lot of reasons, if they slip, they can they have lacerations, they can bleed from that. Um, the, your navigation will be off. All sorts of things, right? 
So once you're doing that, you know, we can pra we'll practice this in the operating room uh, when, when, when we leave here, but you kind of, uh, I'll show you that you want to be very stable with the hand with the two pins, place it, anchor it, and then slowly bring the one pin in. Uh, and then, and then we'll clamp them down and I'll, and I'll show you how to do that. You go to 60 to 80 pounds of pressure. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so if you're ever doing that, it's one of those things that don't, don't take it for granted, really focus on where you're going. You want this single pin to line up with the center between the two pins that they're on straight, really, really focus on what you're doing. You don't want to be pinning in the squamous temporal bone. Absolutely not too thin of bone hit the middle, middle meningeal artery. Um, so usually when we're pinning and it's going to be around here, you want to be just above it in the superior temporal line. And we'll go over that again uh, when we get to the kind of the practical part of this. All right. Let's go over a few common approaches. Again, this is going to be a little redundant with uh, with Aria's lecture, but uh, it's, it's another way to think of things. It's one thing to think of, oh, here's where the MCA is, here's where the ACA is, here's ICA, all of that kind of stuff. Great, I got that. But what about when you're coming at it from a terional perspective? Where is it when you're coming at it from an orbital zygomatic? Where is it when you're coming from a, sub uh, a subfrontal approach, right? When you're coming transphenoidal, all those things to be able to kind of 3D turn that around in your mind is difficult, right? So you need to, uh, I, I encourage you when you're reviewing that anatomy, review it from that perspective. It's very, it's, it's difficult even when you're a resident to do that, all right? So it's always, it's always good to review that. So just a couple. On the right, you have some of the anterior and middle skull base approaches, right? Everything from transphenoidal coming through the nose to the orbital zygomatic, taking off the, the, the rim of the orbit. The terional, which we'll go over, is kind of the, what we call the workhorse of the skull base surgery, Kawase approach. Each of these is its own hour long lecture, so we're not going to go too detailed into those, but I do want to kind of touch a little bit on one of the, uh, some of the, the most common ones that we do and the most common questions that you'll get from these, okay? So the first one, the terional craniotomy, uh, like I said, the workhorse of, of cranial, uh, cranial skull base surgery. Um, what you'll do, first question, where's the burr hole? It's always in the keyhole, right? There's two types of keyholes. One's gonna be the, the difference of which is, might be a little bit above this, but you're gonna put it in the keyhole, feel on your head right here, this little divot, right? Feel right there, that's the keyhole, right? So that's, that, that's, you want that to be your anterior extent. So that's where everyone always wants to put one of the burr holes, one kind of down just above the zygoma, and usually one, one around here just to kind of facilitate stripping of the dura. Once you take off that skull flap, right, you're gonna, you're gonna be looking at this picture right here, okay? You, we're gonna drill down the sphenoid wing. And again, that's something that's very difficult to kind of wrap your head around and we can, we can go over it in the, uh, in the practical base course. But the question that you're always gonna get is what are you gonna see as you come along the greater wing of the sphenoid? You're gonna see the meningal orbital band, right? It's a detachment of the dura. It's the extent of it's the the lateral border of the superior orbital fissure. The reason that's important is because once you start getting into that, a lot of cranial nerves in there. So that's usually where we stop with our sphenoid will wing drilling. Um, so that's that's a very common question to be asked from that. Okay. So uh, uh, keyhole burr hole, right? Zygoma burr hole, meningo orbital band, border of the the superior orbital fissure. Okay. Next, you open up the dura. This is why we drill the sphenoid wing because without this part of uh, Without that drilled there, that, that dural extent is, is uh, very much in your face, covering up the optic nerve and all the important structures that you did the craniotomy to see in the first place. So this is what the, just a, a very rudimentary kind of uh, diagram of what you're gonna see. This is what it's gonna look like in the operating room. This is with a, um, uh, with a, a pituitary tumor right there. You have the optic nerves coming back towards the optic chiasm. You have the ICA with some atherosclerosis in between there. That's why it looks a little yellow coming into the ACAs, which would go up into the ACOM right here. MCA is coming down and going, coming towards you, right? So going from this picture to this is, is, is what the, the preparation's all about, looking at not just the diagram, uh, transport or uh, uh, taking that into the actual operating room and look, kind of looking at videos before. That's, that's always helpful. Next, the retrosigmoid craniotomy, right? So this is a posterior uh, fossa approach. Um, uh, this is based on uh, being, like it says, retrosigmoid, behind the sigmoid sinus. So this is the transverse sigmoid junction. The, where all of these sutures meet is at the posterior, right? That's the, one of the most common uh, uh, questions. This is the meeting of the lambdoid suture, parietomastoid and occipitomastoid sutures. All three of them meet together in the asterion. It's a nice little kind of almost like a divot, like it's a, it's like kind of like a flattening of the skull that you can feel. Um, so that marks the transverse sigmoid junction. 
it's not perfect. People have done anatomic studies, but but in general, that's kind of what people will ask you. Okay, so always remember that asterion, the meeting of those sutures, what that marks. That's where your burr hole will start. Um, another thing is once you're flip flopping, you know, flipping this flat forward, in order to not make it into the ear, some people might ask you, what are you going to encounter before you get to the ear? That's the spine of Henley, right? So that's one. That's another kind of high yield topic right there. Next, Ari already showed this picture, um, but this is. You know, depending on what you're doing, you're going to see different views, right? You're never going to do a retrosigmoid craniotomy and see all of these in one view in the microscope. Don't work like that, right? So if you're doing microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia, you're going to be up at the top of this. Like you said, superior petrosal vein, aka Dandy's vein, is always going to be right there. Everyone will always ask that 100% of the time, right? Uh, you go down, you have the 7-8 complex. You're going to see sort of loops of ICA. You're going to see uh, the labyrinthian artery. You're going to see the subarcuate artery. Um, in those structures. You, you look further down, you're gonna see the lower cranial nerves and, and things like that, right? And, and the pica loops. So these are the kind of things to know exactly where you're going to be um, uh, and be able to, to correlate that with what you're seeing in the operating room, okay? Next for the endoscopic and the nasal approaches, a favorite here at Jefferson. Uh, so this again, very high yield stuff here. So this is kind of what you'll see after ENT does the most of their thing. Um, you can see we'll start at the top here. So the planum things coming, kind of coming back at you. This roof of your of your uh, of your view right here. Um, the planum anterior to that is when you're going to start getting into the ethmoids, crystalgalia, that kind of thing. The planum you can just think of it as kind of a flat portion of bone. You get to the tuberculum cella, which is going to be just before you hit the cella, uh, which is that that uh, that kind of indentation right there behind that the dorsum cella. Okay, then getting into the clivus. All right. Uh, what's asked 100% of the time on these is going to be the optical carotid recess, right? So you know that on either side, you're going to have your carotid, your carotid artery. It's never going to look like this, right? Um, you're going to have the optic canal, but, but one of the things is the OCR, the optical carotid recess, there's always going to be some divot kind of in the upper right corners, right? So if someone asks you and there's some indentation in there, optical carotid recess, right? This is what it looks like when you take off a lot of the bone. Usually you're just going to be seeing this kind of superior portion right there and not the carotids completely unroofed usually, but just so you know, just to kind of have that, as Dr. Roten always called it, the x-ray vision, right? So behind the clivus, you have the basilar and all those perforators, the pituitary and the cella, obviously. Above that, you're going to have the optic chiasm, the optic nerves, and then above that, you're going to have the anterior cerebral arteries, right? So it's another, just another perspective on, on how you're encountering this anatomy, all right? Next, the, the, the more interesting stuff, we'll get to the spine. Um, so for some of the approaches, so you, uh, you, you need to know kind of what approaches you're, you're doing and what you're doing to the spine. I think the, the best way for you all to separate, and there's more than this, but just get kind of the terminology down. What are we doing? There's, you can separate it into, into two main categories. What are we decompressing? What are we fusing? Right? So it's fairly simple. If there's, if there's uh, compression on a neural structure that needs to go away, we're decompressing it. What are we doing? Is it because the lamina and the ligaments compressing it? So we're doing a laminectomy. Is there a disc herniation? We're doing a discectomy. Is it in the foramen? We're doing a foramenotomy, right? Is it, are we not, is there an overgrown joint compressing the nerve? We're doing a facetectomy, okay? That's the, uh, taking off the facet joint. And then if there's some sort of dis dysplasia or something wrong with the vertebral body that you're doing a corpectomy, taking out the whole vertebral body, right? That's then you want to separate that from what we're fusing then, okay? The reason we fuse is if there's abnormal motion, uh, either due to a fracture or some sort of instability on their own, they have a spondylolisthesis, they have a fracture from a trauma, or are you creating that instability by doing like a facetectomy? You have to take off the joint. That destabilizes it, so then you have to fuse those two segments. How are you fusing those, right? So it's these are all just variations of trying to do the same thing. You're trying to get bone in a graft in between the two vertebral bodies in order to have them fuse together. Are you doing it from a transforaminal approach? Are you doing it from an anterior approach? Any lift is lumbar inner body fusion, okay? Um, uh, or are you doing it from an oblique approach or anterior to the psoas, right? So if you go back here, this is kind of the difference. This is this is why this, ana this anatomy is actually a lot more complex, right? So uh, so you have the the trans psoas, you'll have the uh, going in front of the psoas for the the, the oblique portion portion. So you want to know what your approach is going to be and how you're achieving that fusion. The good lateral posterior lateral fusion. Before we had all these fancy tools, people just uh, decorticated the joints, took out the cartilage, and then and then had a lot of bone graft, and it worked very well. So, but a lot of times we have all, a lot fancier methods of getting things to fuse together now. 
So what are you going to be looking at when you're doing an X-lift or a lateral lumbar interbody fusion? So a lot of times it depends. A lot of this is going to be minimally invasive, so it'll be under X-ray. So you're not necessarily going to see this picture, but sometimes people like to do it with a sort of uh, direct docking, direct visualization of their docking. Some of our attendings here do that. So you might be able to see, look down on the side and see that psoas muscle in front of the vertebral, in front of the vertebral bodies. If you see a nerve running over the psoas muscle, a little nerve, it's all 99% of the time, it's going to be genital femoral nerve, right? Genital femoral. We always are always monitoring. We're monitoring for, um, uh, for or doing neuromonitoring during these. We're monitoring the femoral nerves. We're monitoring uh, kind of the muscular parts of it. We usually aren't monitoring the sensory parts. That's why people do kind of the direct docking to look at the sensory nerves that we're not damaging those. But a lot of times you're going to be seeing the genital femoral nerve, okay? Another thing that people ask is they'll pull up the MRI and what are they looking at for to do these X lifts? They're looking at the psoas anatomy, right? So you have the vertebral body in the center, the psoas is on each side. This is a perfect X lift case because the psoas, is, you think of them as your pillows when you're going through, they're, they're, they're padding you. If you have what we call a Mickey Mouse psoas, where you have the vertebral body here and the two psoas is kind of at the top of them, not covering up the nerves, that's a contraindication to doing this procedure, right? You, you don't have that pillow protecting you from the nerves and you'll have a higher chance of having some nerve damage. It also brings the nerves forward, whereas if this is sitting here, the nerves are usually kind of at the, the back part of the, of the psoas muscle, right? So that's another thing that you'll commonly be asked. Then what is a T-lift? This is kind of the, one of the workhorses of spine surgery. So what exactly is it? What exactly are you doing in a T-lift? So we're taking off, we're doing a facetectomy. These are the simple, there's three cuts doing this facetectomy. So what you'll see is you'll see someone uh, cut out to the pars, you'll see them cut down to the lamina, and that takes off the inferior articulating process, right? And then, you, and then you'll see a nice shiny piece of bone that's going to be the superior articulating process, kind of the face of which is coming out at you. They'll take that out and you'll get into what's called Camden's triangle, okay? So these, you, you want to kind of review what the borders of the Kamen's triangle are. You're going to have the spinal dura medially. You're going to have the nerve kind of above you, uh, the pedicle then below you. Uh, the, uh, a lot of times people will ask you, what nerve are you looking at? If this is um, the L4 pedicle above the nerve, then it's the L4 nerve below the pedicle. The, the named nerve comes just underneath the pedicle. All right. So, and then what you're doing is you're taking off this joint and then you're sneaking in a graft in between just underneath that nerve. Okay. All right. Now, during the case, all right, so what do we, what do we, how do you succeed and how do you make a, an impression during the case? So one, you'll, a lot of times you'll be making incision, okay? Uh, don't just gr kind of grab the knife and, and start slicing. Really think about what you're doing, okay? What are you cutting over, right? Are you cutting, is your incision over a shunt that exists? You don't want to slice through the shunt. So, so be, uh, be very cognizant of what exactly are you cutting? Should I be going down to, should I be going just through epidermis and leaving the dermis intact? Should I be going through the dermis? Am I going into the fat layer? Am I cutting through the galea? Is there temporalis below me? Right? Think about those things. Um, you can hold your scalpel either of these ways. One attending will tell you the one on the left makes you look dumb. The other attending will tell you the one on the right makes you, it doesn't matter. All right. Um, just whatever is most comfortable, but I would stick to either of these two because don't, don't kind of just hold it in a bald fist. Um, this is not variable. This is 100% is what you need to be doing when you're making this. Don't bevel the incision, right? So you want to be 90 degrees and you want to be perpendicular to the skin. Otherwise, this little picture on the right, it starts to look like that, makes the closure look, uh, look poor. So it's, it's, it's bad form and it's very easy uh, uh, to do. So really think about it. It might seem obvious, but when you're coming across the convexity, making like a cranial incision, sometimes you're, you're switching that angle of, the, of your blade. So be very cognizant of that, okay? Next for the craniotomy. So a lot of times you'll be using the perforator. I've never really let a, a, a sub I use kind of the more the cutters or the, the matchsticks. Those are a little more complex, a little more high risk. But a lot of times you'll be using a perforator because it stops on its own, right? So just make sure you're per, they're perpendicular to the skull. We'll be working on that kind of in the, in the lab. Um, keep it on full speed. The drill is not safer because you're making it slower, right? It's actually more dangerous. It's not cutting as well. So full speed, wait until it stops on its own, wiggle it out slowly, come out controlled. It's the same thing when you're doing with the craniotome, nice and controlled, okay? So, uh, so it's, it's light pressure, moving it forward, making sure that you have the, this, with this foot plate, you have the heel into the dura and you have your toes up so that you're not cutting into the dura, slowly moving it forward. And then when you're coming to that burr hole that you're connecting, you wanna make sure that you're under control, that you're not, that you don't slice out and, and slice someone's fingers off, all right? Just, just show that you have that, that touch, that natural feel when you're doing these things, right? <laughs> then closing. A lot of times you're going to be closing. 
Um, uh, there's a lot of different sutures. We can have your own lecture on what the, uh, the suture types, all the stitches that you can throw. In general, just think about a couple things. One, you don't want it to be too tight. This excessive, this excessive tension thing on the left is very important. Don't strangle the skin. If it starts to look like it's kind of rolling up on itself and looking all white and devascularized, that's just relax a little bit, right? Make it, make it a little looser. And then make sure the two edges are coming together, that they're opposed correctly, right? You don't want them to be inverted. You don't want one overlapping the other. Those are your goals, right? Whatever suture you're, you're using, whatever technique you're using, that's your goal is to make it look like that. And uh, a lot of attendings and people here always say, if it, if it looks good, it's going to heal good, all right? So, so make it look very pretty. Uh, this suture on the right, I suggest practicing some subcuticular stitches. We use it a lot for in both cranial and spine. Just practice on a model. Practice palming the needle driver. Practice making it look kind of smooth when you're uh, when you're moving through things. We can go over this in the lab too, and kind of some things to work on. Right? Practice your tying. Right? It's, it's kind of the first thing that everyone's going to have you do when you start your sub eye. They'll have you tie. If you, if you don't know how to tie, I, I'm I'm not going to let you then throw the stitch. Right? We got to go through tying. But if you tie, then you get to throw the stitch. If you throw the stitch well, then you get to throw all the stitches as well. Then you get to throw the, the fascial stitch well. Then it's like, oh, maybe this person should then uh, be helping me out with more complex things. And you keep moving along. And the next thing you know, we forget you're even a sub eye, right? We think you're an intern. Right? And that's, that's, that's where you want to be. So the other thing, and this is, this is one of the more, more difficult things. And this is kind of when you talk about like, you know, the, the joke on, uh, oh, cut a tail. Not that long, not that. You never know what you want. The expectations are so, are so kind of uh, uh, abstract and, um, so knowing how to help in the operating room, it's like you want to be present, but you don't want to be in the way. Don't be too present. You know, be there, but don't 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 be in my way. Uh, so uh, you want to know exactly how to help to seem helpful. So that I so that people came out of that case was like, oh, that med student was great in there, and not like, oh, they were they were in my way. They were doing this. So um, uh, and that's very difficult to define. So just a couple concepts. One, try to predict what's needed next. Don't get into the, the, the scrub text way. If they're going to hand it to them, don't rip it out of their hand and do that, right? Have like a little, uh, kind of social awareness with that. But if, for example, if they're over there kind of fixing the drills and counting things or whatever, and your resident, you know, that they're making about that they're making incision with a knife. What's next? It's the bovie. You know that and they're over there. So hand them the bovie. It's helpful. It's a small thing, but like, if you're constantly being helpful with that, it's, it's important irrigating when drilling when they pick up a drill pick up some irrigation you know that's going to happen every time even if they don't want irrigation in that moment you having irrigation and you're ready that's 100 percent of the time always going to be helpful okay securing the bone flap nothing worse than dropping a bone flap so when someone's having that that last cut of the craniotomy they might not be letting you do it they just met you whatever put a little finger on it don't be in their way but just just show that you know that it's important to keep a bone flap uh, on the table right suctioning when needed so uh if if you see someone struggling if, if a resident's in there by themselves trying to kind of retract while they're doing this grab the retractor or grab a sucker do something to kind of help them help them see it's the same thing with suctioning and with irrigating just think one concept is if you can't see they can't see right so if there's a bunch of bone and a bunch of bunch of crap covering it irrigate it out because if you can't see it they can't see it right but if you're flooding the field you can't see it they can't see it and they can't see it because of you so uh, so try not to do that, right? And then if there's and then and then suction uh, help them suction things out. But be cognizant of what you're sucking, right? Is it is their brain under you? Uh, we can kind of go over. We'll we'll take a look at the suctions in the operating room and kind of when to be sucking where and things like that. Um, uh, so just be cognizant of, of what you're doing with those, right? Then helping the scrub techs and the nurses at all possible, pulling in gloves. Uh, if they want to help you kind of, um, or if you, if they're asking you to help clean off some bone to, to make for an autograph or something like that, absolutely do that. That's, that's a great thing for you to do. It's a great way to, to show that you're, um, uh, that you're, that you're being helpful. Okay. All right. So then post-op, what do you do with your patients? So this is kind of getting into Mike's thing, but it's just a, a couple more notes. One, always round on your patients, even if you're not presenting them, just we notice when you did a case and I walk by and I see you in the room, I, at the end of the day, we're here to take care of patients, right? So go, go ask them, see how they're doing. If you have some concerns or you have something like, or something you think something might be wrong with the patient, talk to the resident about it. You know, those are one of the things that, that you're, that's, it's a good impression to make. Oh yeah, the student was rounding on their own time because they did the case and it felt important to them, right? Uh, noting the pertinent pauses and negative labs. So like Mike said, when you're rounding on these things, um, one way that I didn't appreciate a lot when I was rotating, but I think is very important is this, I don't know if every medical school uses it, but the RIND framework, the reporter, interpreter, manager, expert, 
you don't appreciate it. It sounds very like kind of almost stupid as a medical student, but it's really so important. Uh, you don't want to be reporting anymore, right? You don't want to be the person that's that says, oh, the sodium's low, it's 130. Okay, go to the next thing. You should be at the very least be interpreting why is it low, all right? And what does it mean to be low? That's the very, very least. But what your goal is to be is managing things, right? So not only why is it low, but what are we doing about it being low, right? Are we fluid, should we be fluid restricting them? Whenever something is wrong, whenever you notice something wrong, just in your head, think, what would you do about this? And just suggest it. It's not going to be right, all right? It's just not going to be. We don't, ex but that's the thing. We don't expect it to be right. We don't expect, you're, you're medical students. We've all been there. We didn't know what we were doing either. But the fact that you're trying, the fact that you're making notes of this, and the fact that you're saying like, oh, maybe we should get this consult. I'm going to say, all right, we, well, we don't need that consult, but that's a good thought, right? That's another way to make a good impression on this, okay? One way to think about it, and I, I think Mike went over this, but if you're ever rounding on a complex ICU patient, just break things down into systems, right? And make a list of problems per system, head to toe, right? So you, so you go neuro, ENT, lungs, heart, kidneys, genital urinary system, uh, ID, uh, hematology, go through what problems are in each one, what things do we need to solve, right? Those are the kind of ways to be organizing yourself. Uh, and the next thing, kind of a next level thing to think about is ask yourself, how do we get this patient home, right? Not that we're, and I'm not talking about the kind of this, this thing about uh, gomers and kicking people out. That's not what I'm talking about. How are we progressing this patient? How are we trying to get them back to their families? How are we trying to get them to rehab, okay? What does it need to happen? Do they need to see physical therapy? Uh, are they not able to feed themselves and they have a temporary feeding tube and may need a permanent feeding tube? Those kinds of barriers, that's that next level managing of the patient that you're not just kind of reporting what's going on. You know what's next. How are we moving things forward? Those are important concepts that we try to get our interns to think about. If you are demonstrating those things prior to even being an intern, next time I see Dr. Farrell, I'm going to be like, if you don't take this person, I'm going to be very upset because I, I won't even have to teach them next year. So it'll be, so those are, those are kind of some things to demonstrate, right? So that's it. Just a couple points. Uh, hope uh, our goal here is to not go over everything, right? It's, it's impossible. You're not going to be able to learn, but just again, a couple points from each case, a, a couple ways to be helpful, a couple things to, to kind of make a little bit of impression. All of those things go such a long way when you're making these rotations, all right? Thank you guys.